everybody and welcome to the dry dock episode 289 this week the questions are taken from guides 362 and 363 that's on hms eskimo the tribal class destroyer of world war ii and of course the luck vampire yukikaze and then we have quite a few other videos operation crossroads and the japanese submarine campaign of world war ii the opening stages thereof. Those are the Wednesday videos. But then we also have two Friday videos, Callahan's Night Action at Guadalcanal, the new analysis by Robert Lundgren, and Battleship Armor Engineering, basically why naval armor is multiple layered. So with all that in mind, let's kick off with some questions. Paul S. asks, Frequently I hear you say sold for scrap at the end of your five-minute guides. Let's say that I wanted to buy an obsolete warship for personal use. For example, I've seen at least one example of a surplus military tugboat that's been converted into a houseboat. Do you have any idea how much scrap warships cost? It depends greatly on what exactly is the warship that's being scrapped. Um, unfortunately, being the spoil sports that they are, a lot of the time navies tend to put very strict conditions on the sale of some of the their obsolete warships. So, for example, um, a couple of years ago when some Type 23s were up for sale, and actually last year when a Type 23 was up as well, you could technically look at the ship in the catalogue, but it was marked as for scrap only, i.e. if you bought the ship from the MOD, they would legally by contract expect you to scrap the ship and you wouldn't be able to use it for personal use, like a ha uh, houseboat or something. And trust me, I've thought of the idea a few times. One of me and Mrs. Drack's cunning plans at one point was to buy a nice bit of land by a riverside, hire a JCB digger for a week or so, dig out a massive, essential, the dry dock kind of thing in the dirt, then obviously use the JCB to breach the riverbank so that the water could flood in, and then bring a ex Royal Navy vessel of some description in and then use the JCB to fill in the, uh, the, the water around the vessel as it, once it was on the land, obviously rebuilding the riverbank and hey, presto instant house and good luck to any local council who wants to try and demolish that. But probably in anticipation of people like me doing that, the uh, Navy, as I said, tends to sell their bigger stuff for scrap only, or obviously if it's still serviceable, it goes off to other navies. On the smaller scale of things, however, if you wanted to do something with, you know, something about the size of a tugboat or particularly a, a minesweeper, a few years ago, the Royal Navy did have a few minesweepers up for sale, which, to be fair, are large enough to make decent-ish houseboats, especially with a little bit of conversion work. And they were available for between 30 and 60,000 pounds, which really isn't a lot, um, especially if you're going to make them into a home. The only problem was that because they were not fully decommissioning the entire class, they and they therefore needed spare parts, they had actually stripped the craft of all well, pretty much all machinery. Some of the basic electronics were still there, but things like the engine were gone, was gone. But if you bought it, you would be expected to arrange to get it out of the Navy base, which I was sort of looking at going, yeah, the, the whole removal of the engine part, that may have complicated this exercise a little bit. If they'd left the engine in place, I seriously would have considered going for one. But as it was, I thought, you know the cost of hiring a tug to tow this ex minesweeper from Portsmouth around the coast to wherever it is I wanted to put it would probably exceed the cost of actually purchasing the blasted thing in the first place. So I didn't, but that's my experience with the MOD and you know, periodically looking to see if there's any ex warships that might be in my purchasing range. 
I don't know what things are done like in other countries, you know, in the US and so forth. But given the relative lack of houseboats and personal boats um, and ships in the more recent years that are anything other than, like you mentioned, a, a surplus tugboat or something small like that, I rather suspect they have similar rules. Vicky asks, why did the Imperial Japanese Navy have so much difficulty, even ignoring the problem of hard starts, which led to their use of air rather than oxygen at startup, designing the oxygen system for the Type 93 torpedo? The material and design requirements of pressure vessels, tubing and fittings for high pressure oxygen service should already have been well known by the late 1920s and early 1930s from experience with industrial, medical and aeronautical oxygen systems. Well, there were a few problems that differentiated the development of the torpedo from other areas. Um, first, you've got to remember that the use of oxygen in, as opposed to just air, in industry, in hospitals, etc., was still a relatively new thing. You're, you know, by the late 1920s, you're talking maximum a couple of decades since it's really hit the market. And on top of that, you've got the fact that an awful lot of those uses in the interim were enriched oxygen. You know, even in military uses, things like the uh, torpedoes that the Nelson-class battleships used, used an enriched oxygen mixture, not a pure oxygen mixture. And with that comes the fact that pure oxygen is really surprisingly good at oxidizing things, which usually translates to making things burn. And that meant that you know, the, the kind of very, very minuscule tolerances that could be permitted in an enriched oxygen system weren't permissible in a pure oxygen system. You know, the slightest little burr or a bit of swarf left in a pipe, pure oxygen will make it combust and that'll lead to a sudden overpressure and suddenly boom goes the torpedo when you really, really don't want it to. And, you know, similarly, you know, if you want to use an oxygen mask in an aircraft, that can use things like rubber hosing for the amount and pressure that's being used in a torpedo. You can't use that, which you know, goes back to the whole problem of getting those very, very fine tolerances for metal tubes. And you also have, the best way to put it is the fact you, you face a paradox when you're doing torpedoes, which is that on the one hand, you are mass producing them on a much larger scale than most other metal based systems for the transport of pure or enriched oxygen. And obviously mass production comes with its own problems because tolerances necessarily for mass production have to be ever so slightly less than they would be for effectively artisanal handcrafted stuff where if something's oh so slightly off you can just make the very slightest of adjustments and that's not to say that you know industrial medical and aeronautical systems weren't being produced in large numbers but they're not usually in the 20, 20s and 30s being production lined you know you you can order a medical device, an industrial device, uh, an aeronautical device. But those devices are not going to be, you know, someone's not going to sit down in a factory and build hundreds and hundreds of them each year in a, in a mass chain. They're going to be produced in smaller batches and rigorously checked to a degree that, while technically possible, would massively delay the introduction into service of something like a torpedo. So th there is that element to it, but also whether it's industrial, medical or aeronautical, those systems are not usually going to suddenly be violently catapulted into a very hard contact with a semi-solid object, like, you know, being kicked out of a torpedo tube into the water all of a sudden, and then being ramped up to highway speeds as it goes motoring on through the water and that brings a whole subset of additional issues you know shock damage this again you know when we talk about leaving the tiniest burr or whatever in the system a very slight bend kink uh, 
deformity in the system and boom. Whereas <laughs> with the best will in the world, if you even if you did mass manufacture oxygen masks for medical use, for example, and the attendant pumps, you usually don't catapult those things off a hospital roof and into a nearby swimming pool because that will tend to break them. Whereas with the torpedoes, they had to endure that as a launch event. And so the tolerances have to be, and the durability have to be even higher whilst simultaneously they have to be built en masse because they are in the end one shot weapons. And that leads to complications. Ian Carr asks, when you see a cut down rear funnel on Royal Navy destroyers, apparently in an effort to improve their anti-aircraft gun arcs, does this have any impact on their steaming? Technically speaking, yes, but practically no. And the whole reason for this is draft. Now, draft is essentially the height at which the hot gases are expelled above a boiler or burner. So, you know, if you happen to have a burner or fireplace in your home, you'll have a chimney on a ship. It's called a funnel. They're pretty much the same thing. And the taller that you can make it because of the way that hot gases rise, the more the the draft is, i.e. it will pull cold air into the furnace as the hot air leaves through the funnel or chimney and thus improves the flow rate of air to the fire, which therefore means that the fire burns more efficiently and thus gives you better energy and you know a better energy for the amount of fuel you put into it. And this is why when, for example, at Calabria, Giulia Cesare is hit in the funnel by war spite, it causes Cesare's speed to drop because now the draft to her boilers isn't as great, which in turn means a number of things. I mean, smoke, rather than escaping up through the funnel, is now more prone to just blow out into the engineering spaces, which isn't particularly good. But also you've got less power coming from the boilers. Now, when you get to something like a destroyer towards the end of World War II, cutting down the rear funnel, if indeed it is a destroyer that has two funnels, will on the absolute face of it, reduce its steaming capability because now some of its boilers don't have as good a draft. However, oil-fired ships don't need draft quite as much as coal-fired ships. They both still do to a very great extent, hence the effect on Cesare at Calabria, but there is a slight reduction in the need when it comes to oil because of the way that it's burnt. Uh, essentially it being sprayed in a fine mist, which is much easier to combust than a big pile of coal, which can very rapidly, without enough draft, you know, have areas that aren't really getting much oxygen, therefore don't burn very well. But the main thing, because that, that's really a very minor detail, the main thing is that by the end of the Second World War, the vast, 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 vast majority of warships had full-time blowers in the boiler rooms, which drew air down and created a positive pressure environment in the machinery spaces, whose only exit was through the funnels. And that obviated, to a certain extent, the need for draft, depending on how much pressure you actually wanted to put in. Because the whole point of a funnel with with um, draft is to create a difference in pressure to draw air up. But the, the other way is obviously to ram air into the boiler room to create uh, more oxygen flowing through. Because as we just said, that's then the only exit is via the funnel unless the pressure gets so high that it overcomes the blowers itself, which, yeah, hopefully that's not going to happen. Um, and late warships, and to be honest, even a lot of ships built in the 30s had full-time blowers rather than in the 1910s and uh, 1900s when coal-fired ships were much more prevalent. What they were at that point have called forced draft was not a kind of 24-7 thing. It was more of a emergency use only thing. And thus, for a late World War II British destroyer, the existence of permanent blowers to create a positive pressure in the engine room 
would have mitigated quite considerably against any loss of natural draft from the funnel. AR4040 Smith asks, Japan's well-deserved reputation for awful prisoner of war treatment was thoroughly documented by the end of World War II, but was their treatment of foreign power prisoners always so bad? Or did it steadily get worse as the military dictatorship took over? No, in actual fact, Japanese treatment of prisoners of war in, for example, the Rus Russo-Japanese War was noted as being as of one of the highest standards in the world. You know, Red Cross observers went to prisoner of war camps where Russian soldiers and sailors were being kept after various battles like Tsushima, and they were looking at it going, you know, this is actually pretty much the standard everyone should adhere to. Uh, this picture, for example, shows poor old Admiral Rozesvensky vi being visited in person and being shown respect by Admiral Togo, the man who just defeated him at Tsushima. Of course, yeah, things take a little bit of a turn somewhere in the interwar period once the whole Bushido, etc. comes in and Japan goes full militant dictatorship. Essentially, and bearing in mind this is the kind of sociological history which is not my forte, but it is such an integral part of you know the Japanese way of conducting a war in the 20, early 20th century that, by inference, you kind of have to pick some of it up if you study the Imperial Japanese Navy. The very, very short version, at least as far as I can tell, seems to be... The best way I could put it would be, it's kind of, sort of, the fault in, to a very, very small degree, of the Western powers, um, the European and American powers. Now, that is not to say in the slightest that it excuses what the Japanese would do to prisoners in World War II. They are 100% culpable and guilty of it. But, prior to the end of World War I the Japanese seem to have had this cultural idea, at least from the Meiji Restoration through to the end of World War I, that the reason that they were perhaps looked down upon by other people, um, foreigners, was because Japan was self-admittedly somewhat backward. They you know, they would come out of a semi-feudal era in a period where most, most Western quote-unquote countries had been at the height of the Industrial Revolution for about half a century. And so they concluded that the way for them to gain respect was to become a fully industrialized nation, another great power on the playing field. And, you know, in a probably slightly more forward thinking view of things than you might expect for the early 20th century, they essentially looked around and went, well, there's obviously massive cultural differences between a Russian, a German, a Frenchman, an Italian, a Spanish person, a British person, an American, etc. And they can still all acknowledge each other as great powers to one degree or another. Therefore, if we put ourselves at that same level, they will also acknowledge us as equals. Yeah, early 20th century racism kind of yeah, that, that wasn't going to happen. Um, <laughs> the, and the, they were thoroughly disillusioned of that fact by sort of the late 1910s, early 1920s with the various negotiations that were going on. The Washington Treaty didn't help. Um, and so, and again, you know, please bear in mind, this is my reading of it. Um, if someone has read much deeper into the sociological breakdown of Japanese society from... 1890s to the 1940s and has a different opinion please say in the comments but the with that background what it seems to be is to, at least to me is that in the 1900s the Japanese had this idea of we will prove ourselves to be as good if not better than these other nations that call themselves great powers and so if the rules say that you should treat your prisoners with respect and honor, bearing in mind they still do have, you know, there is always a code of honor running through Japanese society, um, then well, fine, okay, that's what the rules say. We will treat them to the utmost standards of honor. You know, we, we will honor ourselves by showing ourselves to be honorable people and, you know, essentially 
honour by magnanimity. You know, yes, we have beaten you, and therefore, because we have proved ourselves to be superior to you, it doesn't cost us anything in terms of honour to show you respect as beaten foe. Because, you know, of course, we, you know, we, we've won, so we can afford to be generous. Whereas by the 1930s and 1940s, it seems that the culture had shifted over, at least in some parts of the Japanese military, to, you know, you have refused, like, we've done everything that you guys did in terms of making ourselves a great power. You still refuse to acknowledge that we are a great power. Therefore, you must be stupid. Therefore, you are inferior. Therefore, we are su inherently superior to you. Therefore, you do not deserve much, if any, respect. You know, basically, you only deserve the respect that the force of arms gives you. And if those force of arms fail you, then now, as the absolutely superior people, we don't owe you anything in the form of respect, honour, good treatment, etc. You're essentially a lower life form that we can do as we will which is actually not that much of a shift. Obviously, in effect, it's a huge shift, but actually in outlook, the whole thing of wanting to prove themselves to be honourable and superior is not that great of a shift in absolute terms. It's just how you perceive yourself within that context and therefore how it makes you act to everybody else. And, you know, they're not exactly alone in the whole... You know, we are the superior people, therefore we don't owe the lesser people anything other than brutality and whatever else we want to do with them mindset. You know, that there were a few regimes over in Europe that kind of adopted a similar outlook around the same time. Cholin asks, I've been watching the Operations Room's excellent videos on the Battle of Samar, and I'm left wondering, what happened to Japanese gunnery? At Guadalcanal, they're gunning down ships left and right, but two years later they can barely hit the broadside of an escort carrier. What happened? It's a mixture of factors. On the one hand, you do have a diminution of Japanese gunnery over World War II because obviously they go into the war with a lot of very highly trained crews. But by 1944-45, an awful lot of those highly trained crews have been killed or wounded in action. And you know, much like the diminution in pilot quality, they've been forced to bring forward classes of new conscripts, enlistees, whatever, new sailors, who therefore are not necessarily going to have been trained to the same standards and for the same amount of time as their pre-war counterparts. And therefore there will be a, a dilution of sk skill just happening because of that. Plus, of course, they're going to be to a degree swapped around various ships and some of the ships that are involved in Samar, while some of them have seen quite regular action, others due to either their strategic importance to the Japanese battle doctrine or to just because of fuel shortages, haven't really been out and about. They haven't seen a lot of active service, so you know the crews don't have as much time to practice, even if they were relatively skilled before. You know that's kind of the skill draining away. But with all that said. Their gunnery still isn't awful. I mean, you know, here we go. Here's Gambia Bay under fire. There's a spread of Japanese shells. That's a very tight spread. You know, that it, that's not bad gunnery. Um, the fact that it's ever so slightly off is that's that's just a general gunnery error. That's just a, a matter of sheer luck. You know. A half set the guns fire up being fired half a second earlier, and that entire salvo could have landed right on top of Gambia Bay. And that leads me to the other part, which is circumstance. The vast majority of battles fought at Guadalcanal were fought at brutally close range. Where okay, yes, you could miss, but it was rather difficult to do so unless you were actively, you know, on fire or being battered about by incoming enemy fire etc you know but if you had a decent firing solution and you weren't at that moment being physically torn apart by shells and torpedoes you had a pretty good chance to hit as long as your gunnery skills were at least somewhat decent and obviously japanese gunners back at that point being mostly their pre-war highly trained lot in a close range action they were going to get a lot of hits samar is 
largely, not entirely, because obviously Johnston, Roberts, etc. do their thing, but it's largely fought at very long range. And at very long range, the slightest offset, you know, as I said, you know, half a second timing on the firing button being pressed, the very tiniest of miscalculations in estimating range, course, speed, etc. The kind of stuff that uh, a Guadalcanal kind of range would make the difference between hitting the bridge and hitting the four funnel at 35, 40,000 yards can make the difference between hitting and not. Um, and that obviously affects it things. Plus, you've also got the fact that initially they think they're looking at fleet carriers and cruisers, not escort carriers and destroyers. That in and of itself is going to affect how they're going to be ranging on things. You know, if you see a relatively small profile of a carrier that's clearly doing its level best to get away from you, you're going to think maybe that's a fleet carrier doing 30, 35 knots, probably at a relatively severe angle, when in fact it might be an escort carrier doing 20 knots, pretty much broadside to you. And that's going to play into things as well. Once, When you look at, um, for example, the number of hits that Johnston takes, um, obviously a lot of them being AP shells just going straight through the ship um, rather than exploding in the ship because they're massively oversized. Um, Japanese gunnery at Samar overall, I wouldn't necessarily say is terrible. They, like with this shot, they clearly do have some gunnery cap good gunnery capabilities left. They've got very decent optical fire control systems. But all these circumstances work against them and then throw in that little bit of blind luck and you get the result that you get. Brendan Boersdorf asks, I'm curious, I know some people dive the wrecks of Operation Crossroads due to their shallow depth, but is there still a risk of radioactive contamination? Technically speaking, possibly. Uh, practically speaking, no. Uh, I did make a little bit of a joke about this, I think, in the video I actually did on Prince Eugen, um towards the end of its five-minute guide. But essentially, obviously, you've got alpha, beta, and gamma particle radiation, um, and that is blocked by various things. Gamma radiation, obviously, being the most dangerous because it propagates through almost everything. And you've got how that radiation is produced. You know, are we talking about fallout from the bombs? Are we talking about objects on the ship that have been made radioactive by the blast, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the, the ship is obviously a very shallow wreck. So whilst she was far too radioactive to be recovered at the time, the half-life of a lot of the radioactive isotopes that were aboard her has, you know, most of them were probably fairly short-lived and they've gone away. Other than that, yes, hosing her down and scrubbing her down didn't remove a lot of the radioactive fallout, but you know, 70 plus years in the ocean, that's a lot of abrasion and a lot of washing and I mean, even, you know, things like rust and rot as well, because if you have radioactive elements, say, saturated into the deck, which was a problem with some of the crossroads vessels, you can't power wash it away because it's embedded in the deck timbers itself. 70 years later, a good chunk of that deck timber is going to have rotted away and just gone, and with it, so would the radioactive particles that were embedded in there if they were still radioactive in the first place. And then, of course, you have the fact that Alpha and beta radiation are a lot easier to block by things like, say, large masses of water. Um, some forms of radiation you can block with a sheet of paper. Um, so, you know, you could have one of the world's most powerful alpha, ra alpha particle radiation sources on the ship, or inside the ship, I guess, and swimming outside it in the water, it poses practically zero risk. Well, basically zero risk to you. Um, I'm not saying there is there, but that, that's by example. And so, you know, the external hull, the, I believe the US Navy looked at it in the 70s and they concluded it's no longer radioactive, it's safe. Um, they've pumped oil out of the wreck, that seems to be safe. So from a practical scale, I would reckon that pretty much most of the wrecks, unless they've got, you know, a 
and they ha unless they happen to have a lump of the fissile material from the bomb itself sitting on them, are probably perfectly safe. Although, as I say, from a very, very technical perspective, there could be some of the nastier radioactive uh, elements or type or materials potentially with deeper within the vessel, which might still be quite dangerously radioactive in and of themselves. But even if they were there, and obviously they're you know, not as subject to the water washing them away, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But even if they were there, as a wreck, the water itself is going to be insulating you from that, plus the hull of the wreck itself, and the fact that you can't get to them as well. Um, if it, if there were you know high-level gamma sources, then the Navy inspections would have found those. So if there is any heavy radioactive material left it'll be alpha or beta particle sources and as long as they are inside the ship where divers aren't really going to be going and the ship remains underwater it doesn't really matter because their danger radius is going to be measured in millimeters or centimeters in a realm where humans aren't going to be within meters or possibly even tens of meters of them and the decontaminating effects of being submerged in the ocean really can't be overstated because well, Bikini Atoll itself, still radioactive. I mean, you can visit it if you want, but don't eat anything there, because <laughs> that will poison you. The man formerly known as Commenting Is What I Do asks, you've often noted that the Kriegsmarine of World War II was hilariously inefficient when it came to many of its ship's designs and constantly went over the treaty limits. But if the Allies had been able to build ships as large as the Kriegsmarine did around the same time, what would the Allies have built and how much more capable would it have been? It's somewhat difficult to pinpoint because, of course, the Allies weren't building ships to exactly the same displacements as Kriegsmarine vessels. And by the time they did the displacement is not necessarily always going to be exactly the same and technology has advanced somewhat. However, um, for heavy cruisers, you know, the Hipper class, for example, um, well, that is the only German heavy cruisers that the Kriegsmarine builds because the um, Deutschlands are the previous, the Weimar Republic ships. Um, but in any case, looking at the Hipper class, the final... Two, the ones that were never completed, Seydlitz and Lutzau, believe it or not, actually displace slightly more standard than a Des Moines class. It's only by a matter of a couple of hundred tons, if that, but still, you know, Prince Eugen is not a million miles away from a Des Moines class, is a displacement, it's about 300 tons lighter. And if you compare a Hipper and a Des Moines, obviously a Hipper has eight guns, a Hipper has maximum of just over three inches of belt armor, just under two inches of deck armor, and of course conventional firing main battery the for four to four point one inch um anti aircraft artillery as a secondary battery, etc. And the Des Moines obviously have an additional gun. They're a lot faster. They have double the belt armor. They have almost, not quite, but almost double the deck armor. Those main guns are auto-firing. <laughs> and the uh, anti-aircraft secondary battery is 5-inch guns, 5-inch uh, 38s, plus obviously all the, the smaller stuff. And you look at a Baltimore class, and to be honest, a Baltimore class has essentially much of the same advantages they don't have quite as thick deck armor but they've still got somewhat better deck armor than a hipper class they've got that double the belt armor thickness they've got the extra gun they've got the extra knot in speed they've got the better anti-aircraft fire control systems and anti-aircraft guns granted their eight inch guns are firing at a more conventional rate but still they've got all those advantages so they are just flat out better than the hippers and they displace two and a half to three thousand tons less than a hipper does. And given that the Baltimores and the hippers are probably a little bit of a fairer comparison than the much later technology Des Moines, I would say that you know for the displacement 
of a hipper, so between 16 and 17,000 tons, depending on the exact ship you're looking at. Most competent Allied navies, especially the British and the Americans, and for that matter, given Algerie, the French as well, could almost certainly have put a 12-gun ship with considerably better armour protection and similar or better speed into the water for the same displacement. And for battleships, it gets a little even more problematic because no one else on the Allied side built a battleship in the 41 to 42,000 ton standard displacement range, which is what you have for Bismarck and Tirpitz. You can go slightly over that and get an Iowa, or you have to go back to you know North Carolina, South Dakota, King George V, which are all six to 7,000 tons less. About the closest you can get, both by time period and close enough in displacement, would be perhaps the 1938 Lion class, which is still coming in uh, 500 to 1500 tons less than a Bismarck. But in exchange for that, it's got a similar top speed. It's got three triple 16 inch guns, so one extra gun and one inch more on the caliber. Um, the secondary battery, okay, it's 5.25s, they're not the world's best, but you know, secondary battery probably pretty much a wash, but it's got considerably thicker belt armor, considerably thicker deck armor. Uh, it's, yeah, it's got the more efficient all or nothing armor design, etc. You know, you can get, and you're getting that still with a, a reasonable amount of displacement left. Whereas if you want something that is pretty much spot on, so let's say Tirpitz's displacement, then you can go over to the Lion 1942 design, which. Well, it's an updated line. The line was already superior to Bismarck, so this one's even better. <laughs> and given what the US managed to pack into the South Dakotas, a, you know, similar to the argument with the heavy cruisers, it's arguable that if they hadn't wanted to go really high speed with the Iowas, then the US might have been able to produce a kind of a mini Montana, essentially a 12-gun South Dakota probably on about the same displacement as a Bismarck or Tirpitz. Alessandro Barreza asks, did ships use other material before the main metal of the armour plate in order to slow down or disrupt an incoming projectile? Perhaps something like another ductile material or some form of spaced armour? As a rule of thumb, no, mostly because just the sheer scale of naval projectiles thanks to our wonderful friend, the returning square cube law, if you're being shot at by a three inch projectile, that, you know, a 75 millimeter, 76 millimeter round, that's one thing, you know, for, for tanks, spaced armor could make a difference there. But then if you're being shot at by a six inch shell, it's twice the diameter, but it's eight times the volume, and therefore there's a lot more shell coming in. So relatively light spaced armor is much less likely to work at that point. And then you think about a 12 inch, 14, 16 inch shell and the kinetic energy that's coming in and, you know, in that relatively dense package is so much beyond what you would have at a, you know, a two inch or three inch projectile that spaced armor really isn't going to be very effective before it gets up to the scale of it actually just becomes armor at which point you might as well have a single thickness of armor because it turns out laminated plates don't work as efficiently. Now, with that said, there were some tricks you could try and pull on incoming shells, like decapping them of their armor piercing caps. Note that the Iowa class's outer STS plate does not function in this manner, but the Italians tried it with the Littorio's armor layout. Now, as I've mentioned in other videos, I'm not necessarily convinced that would be entirely workable, mostly because of the way they did the testing, you know, scaling a smaller projectile and assuming that it would work against a larger projectile, when in fact the tests that have been done with decapping plate style protection systems uh, that were a bit more comprehensively documented show that there is a direct relationship between the gap between the spaced armor plate and the main armor plate and the size of the projectile, i.e. you need a bigger gap, the bigger the projectile. So testing it with a smaller projectile, even if the speed and kinetic energy are the same, is not actually a valid way of testing it because that projectile is just physically smaller. Um, 
to, to see if it will work. And you've also got the fact that you've got the, the infill between the two layers on the Italian ships, which is not air. So it is a denser medium, which does reduce the distance. But what exactly the density of that material was and whether it reduced the distance enough. I mean, we know from the testing it reduced the distance enough to stop a essentially sub-caliber round so from a, from a smaller earlier gun. That's fine. But if you were going to shoot a 15 or 16-inch shell at it, I'm not entirely convinced it would work. So that would be probably the only time anyone seriously tried to do it. But I personally remain unconvinced as to the efficacy of it against larger caliber weapons. The Huskarl asks, This is a bit of professional curiosity for me as a professional welder. I know welding wasn't used in ship hull construction until shielded metal arc welding or stick welding made it practical around the World War I timeframe. However, oxyacetylene welding had been a thing for a while before that. Why wasn't that ever used for hull construction? Was it too dangerous, too low of a deposition rate, it couldn't work with armour alloys, etc.? Now please bear in mind that I know relatively little about how to actually weld other than my current you know, thought percolation of whether or not one of these battery spot welders would be enough to spot weld some mail onto some plate armour. Um, but there is a rather handy display aboard USS Alabama, which I'm very glad I took a photo of in 2022, which you can see on screen at the moment. And having looked at some diagrams of how oxyacetylene welding seems to work versus this, which is the, the stick weld, the shielded metal arc welding, I'm going to suppose or hypothesize that the problem would be that the oxyacetylene welding relies on heating dash melting the two bits of metal to the point that they fuse together, which would therefore not work on most ship you know, beams, girders, hull frames, and armor plates, because at best you would end up welding the very outer layer of that metal to each other and the rest of it would just be sitting butted up against each other which would then make the weld exceptionally weak and therefore the ship would probably snap in half very quickly whereas the sort of rather useful layout using the stick weld here it shows that you actually got the two plates slightly separated and it's actually the expendable part of the stick welder that lays down the material that joins the two together, and as you can see, A, B, C, D in multiple layers. So I think it's that, you know, adding of material via the stick weld that seems to make it viable for shipping. But as I say, that is entirely my supposition based on a limited knowledge of welding in this rather nice diagram. So take that with a grain of salt and use your professional knowledge to see if I'm actually making any sense there. Brian Smith asks, Recently, the National Interest website had an article that the US Navy should have focused on battle cruisers instead of battleships near the end of World War I, and this would have had a positive impact on World War II for the US Navy. This seems to be too much hindsight and not thinking that the cruisers wouldn't have been in Pearl Harbor in, on December 7th anyway. Do you think that having battle cruisers would have had any real impact on early war US Navy doctrine and actions? I'd agree that's probably a bit too much hindsight because you know it's an argument that's very similar to what if the US had completed the Lexington class. Well, yes, obviously they'd be incredibly useful fast carrier escorts in a period before the US could get its fast battleship fleet up and running in the Second World War. And, of course, then you have the question of, well, is the US building these, in, as you said, instead of or in addition to its battleships? Because if they build battle cruisers instead of, say, the Big Five, the Tennessees and the Colorados, what kind of ship are they building? You know, are they building an American Hood style vessel? You know, that could be useful. And we do know in the interwar period during the fleet problems that battle cruisers acting in concert with battleships in a fleet engagement were a perennial problem for US exercises. You know, the idea that a sufficiently fast and reasonably well-gunned set of battle cruisers which could close off the top of the line 
and thus grind down a purely battleship force or hair off to intercept carriers was something they kept running into time and time again. But with the limited budgets the US Navy had and also the limited fuel capability that they had in terms of a limited number of fast fleet oilers in the early part of the war, you know, saying the US Navy should have built five, six, seven battle cruisers instead of five, six or seven battleships is, you know, perhaps pushing it a bit. If you were going to make admittedly still using a lot of hindsight, but potentially a justifiable degree of change to the 1910, late 1910s programs, you could perhaps argue that that balance could be achieved by building Tennessee and California as battleships, and then perhaps reverting to 16-inch guns for the Colorados as, and using them as battleships, because at that point, otherwise, the USA becomes the nation that doesn't have a 16-inch battleship design ready in the ni- early 1920s. So under that scenario, you, for you now, you could take the basic Tennessee-class hull, maybe stretch it a little, drop one of the gun turrets, maybe the super-firing aft turret, introduce some more machinery space, and then you could have a rather nice six-gun forward, three-back, nine-gun 14-inch armed battle cruiser with relatively decent protection, you know, that would actually make a reasonable degree of, of sense. And then, so you, you then have a majority battleship battle fleet. However, you do have some rather nice battle cruisers to cap it off. And two battle cruisers with that kind of firepower and a decent amount of protection would actually make for a very sensible set of escorts for the carriers in the early part and perhaps even the middle part of World War II before the modern fast battleships can take over. Daniel asks, in World War II, the SMS Emden captured the Cormoran and commandeered it to fight for Germany. Can you explain how this happened? Did Emden give a skeleton crew to the new prize? Couldn't Cormoran's captain radio what was happening and blow the entire thing? Well, what happened in this particular case was actually something that happened a few times in 1914 in various parts of the world, and that was that the Germans had a number of small gunboats-very small cruisers that were somewhat old and obsolete that they had on distant patrols in various colonies and so on and so forth. And when Emden captured the ship that would become the Cormoran, which you can see in the picture here, she took her back to port, because at that point the uh, the Germans hadn't yet abandoned Tsingtao or Qingdao, depending on how you like to pronounce it, and they brought her back in, uh, after with Emden obviously bringing her in, and then they took the crew off as prisoners, so the crew of the ship wouldn't be able to you know, make many representations to anyone that the now Cormoran might come up against. And having done that, they then took a number of the guns and other equipment off of the SMS Cormoran, hence the transfer of name, uh, which was one of these small obsolete vessels, and stuck that on this ship, plus transferred most of the crew off, and then also took crew and weaponry from some other gunboats that were in the harbour, and so equipped Cormoran set out. As it turned out, she didn't have a particularly successful uh, career. She was very rapidly chased into port by a Japanese warship, and that was pretty much all she wrote for her career, other than some interesting negotiations with the Americans whose harbour she'd run for cover in uh, later on in the war. But as I said, this happened in several different places around the world. Another example being the SMS, I believe it's pronounced Gier or Gaia, G-E-I-E-R. Germans, please let us know in the comments which was similarly stripped for crew and weaponry to arm an ocean liner to become an armed merchant raider. Rob Smith asks, Over the years, there was a progression in operating pressure and type of steam from low pressure to high pressure to very high pressure, along with a change from saturated to superheated steam, and varying numbers of boilers and engines being provided with said steam. How were the boilers and engines arranged? Were all boilers attached to a single manifold capable of supplying steam to all engines? 
Or was an individual engine fed by a dedicated group of boilers? And if the latter, was it possible to link a working set of boilers to an engine whose boilers were out of action? And are there any records of a captain having a quiet conversation with a chief engineer to get a ship to go as fast as humanly possible? Typically speaking, a group of boilers would supply the steam pressure to a set of engines. And as time went on, boilers got more and more efficient, but also somewhat larger. So, you know, back in, let's say, the 1890s, you might have half a dozen, a dozen or more boilers all feeding the same engine. Whereas by the time you get to World War II, you might have one, two or three boilers feeding a single engine. Obviously, by that point, it would be a turbine. Now, as for whether any given set of boilers could supply any given engine, that's a much more complicated question. It depends hugely not just on the time and on the ship, but also on the layout of the machinery. Because technically speaking, obviously, ideally, you'd have a big set of boilers all supplying a bunch of steam to a big set of engines, and you'd have wonderful interconnectedness so that you know, everything, could, as you said, could you can supply power to other engines if that engine is knocked out, or if a set of boilers is knocked out, then the other boilers can take up the slack. However, that kind of thing needs very large open machinery spaces, which are otherwise known as torpedo here to sink ship with one shot. And so a lot of ships, especially by the time that turbine machinery has really taken hold, certainly in the interwar period at least, are divided up in what's known as a unit system where you would have a set of boilers and their turbine and then another room with a set of boilers and their turbine and those might be not just spaced out horizontally across the ship but spaced out linearly along the ship at which point you know the idea of a set of boilers perhaps on a port outer engine which might be quite far forward also that being able to supply steam to the starboard inner engine which might be several hundred feet further back that's really not going to work because one it would partly compromise the unit system because you need piercings in the bulkhead for the steam lines and two you'd be talking about transporting steam several hundred feet at which point you'd be looking at energy losses and so on and so forth one of the big attractions, for example, of the turboelectric drive was precisely the point if you lost generating power in any number of boilers and or uh, drive power in any number of engines, you could very easily transfer power across to or from other areas because it was an electric system and you just therefore had to keep the voltage levels up. But on some ships where the unit system, which obviously took up more space and weight, was deemed impractical to get a given amount of power and thus speed under a certain treaty weight limit, for example, then the possibilities of linking boilers together to serve engines that they might not otherwise normally have served becomes a lot more viable. And as far as a captain trying to get every ounce of speed out of his chief engineer, Yes, that happened on quite a few occasions. Sometimes it was something just as simple as, you know, in, in the Mediterranean, if you're on a British light cruiser and the captain calling down, uh, there's an Italian 15-inch battleship chasing us. We would like not to get caught. And then, shockingly, a ship that is rated for a given speed or perhaps has taken damage and as a result is rated for a slightly lower speed magically discovers they are capable of three or four knots more than everybody thought they could do. Uh, because a lot of the time, with when it, especially with warships, when it comes to engines and boilers, the maximum rated power output and therefore speed is what the ship can essentially sustain until the fuel runs out. You can usually push it a little bit further, but at that point, the time period of sustainment becomes how long the machinery will last before something catastrophic occurs. So for short bursts, it's entirely possible. And of course... In a lot of earlier ships where everything aboard was steam powered, some later ships would have, you know, diesel or petrol generators or separate sub boilers, which would generate general power for the ship. But in those earlier ships, like I've mentioned a few times before, the Carpathia, when it was trying to rescue Titanic survivors, for example, it was also possible to shut down all other steam using systems. And thus you'd have actually considerably more steam to chuck into the engines than you would normally have. 
Smokey the Bear asks, in the movie Nate and Hayes, a German iron ship with a single gun turret is disabled by placing a shell at the turret rotation stop, which then detonated when the turret is rotated to contact its fuse. Was this even a possibility with such shells of this or any period? Practically speaking, no, because the vast majority of shells at the time, or in most of the time period the channel covers where shells are even worth the name and have fuses, um, are mostly going to be base fused. Armor piercing shells will be base fused or in very early cases just activated by the sheer force of impact. And most high capacity HE common shells are also base fused, which rather mitigates against them really being easily activated in any way, shape or form that doesn't involve an extremely sudden and violent crash into something solid at high speed. However, with it all said, some high explosive shells were nose fused for immediate contact detonation. And in theory, if you were to extremely strongly crush the nose of a shell in a linear direction. So you'd have to either have the nose pointing towards whichever bit of the turret was going to hit the stop otherwise, or have the nose embedded up against the stop and the base is then pressed by the turret. Then in theory, a sufficiently strong rotational motor on the turret might provide enough of a crushing force to initiate the fuse. Um, assuming that the whole thing's been armed in the first place, i.e. the fuse has been inserted. But let's assume that occurs. Then, yes, in a very extreme and specific circumstance with a very specific type of high explosive shell, it might actually work. But equally, it might not, because you might end up just slow crushing it and not setting it off, but irreparably damaging the fuse. Dave Collier asks, could you tell us a bit about the painting The Fighting Temeraire by J.M.W. Turner and the context in which it was painted? Yes, so this painting ostensibly shows the second-rate ship of the line Temeraire, one of the, at the time, last survivors of the Battle of Trafalgar, being towed to her final resting point where she'd be broken up on the Thames in 1838, the painting being painted pretty much almost immediately after and released to the general public about a year later in 1839. So there's a lot of context to the painting, which, you know, it is a painting of a, a, a thing that happened. So Temeraire was towed along the Thames to her final resting place, but the scene didn't look anything like what you see here. Um, basically, Turner used his artistic license to portray a number of themes in the painting, which would be impossible to portray if you were portraying the actual fact of the matter. So, for example, um, you can see Temere is being towed by a steam-powered tug. Now, that did happen, and this is by use of colour and position being used to kind of look at the takeover of the old, you know, the the Battle of Trafalgar, the, the mighty sail-powered ship of the line, the old school, with the new, this kind of somewhat dirty, you know, smoke-belching tugboat, which, in contrast to the almost pearlescent and gold Temeraire, looks very squat and brutal. One of the other examples of the artist, of artistic license is the fact that the, the whole thing is completely the wrong way round in direction. Um, the sun is setting... Uh, Temera is being towed in completely the opposite direction to where she would have been towed for her final breaking up. But, you know, that that's more of just an atmospheric thing. But again, using the theme of sunset to imply at the ending of something. Temera herself looks, you know, looks like she could have just been towed off the docks shortly after coming back from Trafalgar, when in actual fact... You know, as any good navy would have done, Temera had been stripped for every single possible usable spare part before being sold for breaking up. So all her weaponry, all her fittings, um, even her masts and yards and sails and rigging had all been taken off. So she would have looked more just like a hulk, just the hull being towed along. And there was also another tug, <laughs> because you do not want to tow something as large as a ship of the line with a single paddle tug. 
in a river like the Thames, otherwise things are going to go very wrong for you. So, but if you had two tugs, then they'd get in the way of the picture, diminish the scene and the symbolism and so forth. And so Turner just portrays the one tug and obviously sticks in a bunch of other lesser sailing vessels in the background as well. So in in many ways, although it is obviously portraying a thing that actually happened, the painting is about as realistic as most movies that come out with based on a true story um, tagged onto them. But Turner is using the event not so much as a, this is a literally a photorealistic impression of what happened and more of a this is a symbol of a passing era, which it does convey quite well, considering how famous the painting's gone on to become. And finally, Jim Smitty asks... I'm currently on something of a Hornfisher kick right now as I'm reading Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors. In it, Hornfisher talks about how the 5-2 turret on USS Samuel B. Roberts fired 324 out of the 325 rounds stowed for it. It fired so many rounds that safety features failed and the gun barrel was glowing red hot. This led to the loss of the turret as Gunner's, third, Gunner's mate third class car pushed his gun to the breaking point and the 324th round cooked off in the breech of the gun. How hot would that gun have to be to cook off a round before the gun was sealed up and ready to fire, and how hot would it take to get the barrel to glow like that? Well, steel as a rule generally will start to glow red hot somewhere around 550 degrees Celsius, so it's around 1000 Fahrenheit, and I mean, there'll be a slightly perceptible red glow, a little, you know, 50 degrees or so below that. And then as you obviously get higher and higher, it'll become redder and redder and then eventually trend off to yellow. So, I mean, if you rapid fire over 300 rounds through a five inch gun, it's entirely believable that at least portions of it would be glowing, although the whole thing wouldn't be glowing because if you've got, uh, if you've got a, in the whole gun barrel up to you know, a very obviously glowing red heat, then it's going to be so structurally compromised that it's more likely to blow apart or just droop. So it would have been something like maybe the muzzle glowing or certain spots on it glowing. But, you know, definitely could happen. That's, that's entirely plausible. I mean, there are cases of guns that were fired with considerably fewer shells, but relatively rapidly, like, for example, HMAS Sydney's guns when she was pursuing a couple of Italian light cruisers where the guns got hot enough to strip the paint from the guns. So, you know, a 5-inch 38, which is notable for being able to fire very quickly, getting up to a, a soft red glow is in very, very possible. So there's your temperature range. Um, now, as far as how hot would it have to be to cook off the round before the gun's been fully sealed up. Part of that depends on how long the charge is actually sitting uh, in the gun, because obviously the 5-inch 38 uses a separate charge and shell, and that charge is contained in a brass outer container, which is going to obviously mitigate the immediate transfer of heat compared to just a silk bag in perhaps a battleship charge. But the 5-inch 38 uses smokeless powder as its charge, and smokeless powder generally actually has a very low auto-ignition temperature. You're talking about, depending on exactly the mixture, but somewhere in the region of the mid-hundreds. So, you know, by, say, 150, 160 degrees C, smokeless powder, if it's got that temperature in direct contact with it, will ignite. And that's considerably lower than the temperature you need to make the gun barrel itself glow. The mitigation to that, of course, is that the smokeless powder is inside said cartridge case. So that's why I say, you know, the breech, let's say, as you're feeding the charge in, if the barrel is glowing red, that breech is going to be probably well, well in excess of 160, 170 degrees C whatever that translates to in Fahrenheit. And so the, the question at that point is, as I say, how, how quickly are you transferring the cartridge in and then firing the gun? Because there would be the temperature of the breech, and then that will be transmitted to the brass of the cartridge case, which will then be 
gradually transmitted through to the smokeless powder. And if you can get the cartridge fired off before the in inner temperature of the brass cartridge case exceeds 160, 200 degrees C, which would then cause the smokeless powder to self-ignite and spontaneously detonate. Well, if you can get it shot off before then, then great. But the longer it stays in there, the, the longer it takes you to load, the higher the chances are that the smokeless powder is going to auto-ignite. And, of course, the more you fire the gun, the hotter it is. So if, for sake of argument, the breach is at 250 degrees C, then you can probably conventionally feed the cartridge, lock it all up, aim and fire the gun before the auto-ignition temperature of the smokeless powder is reached internal to the cartridge. Whereas, you know, if you've got the gun barrel glowing, the breach might be four or 500 degrees, at which point, you know, much, much higher temperatures, therefore it's going to get to the smokeless powder and raise it up to 150, 160 degrees much, much faster, at which point you might end up with an accident like was described. And that's it for this week, folks. Thank you very much for listening. Hope to see you again in another video sometime soon. See you later. Bye.